Hare Krishna, I welcome everybody to Bhakti Sangha Japa conference call. Today we are very fortunate to have Her Grace Kala Sudha Mataji to enlighten us on topic Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita Madhya Leela 25th chapter 83rd verse onwards. Hare Krishna Kala Sudha Mataji, please accept my humble obeisances. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Guru Maharaj Ki Jai. Thank you so much Mataji for your valuable time and association this morning. Thank you so much for enlightening us on this topic. Please take over the call Mataji. Hare Krishna. Now. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Saita Chandra Jaya Gora Bhatta Vrinda Reading from Shri Chaitanya Charitamrita <clears throat> Madhya Leela Chapter 25 Entitled, The Residents of Varanasi Become Vaishnavas. Text 83 through 86. Text 83. Muktana Kotishwapi Mahamune. Translation. O oh, great sage, out of many millions of materially liberated people who are free from ignorance and out of many millions of siddhas who have nearly attained perfection, there is hardly one pure devotee of Narayan. Only such a devotee is actually completely satisfied and peaceful. Text 84. <clears throat> this verse is from... Uh, Text 83 that we read is a quote, quoted verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, 6th canto, 14th chapter, text 5. Text 84. When a person mistreats great souls, his lifespan, opulence, reputation, religion, possessions, and good fortune are all destroyed. This statement, Srimad Bhagavatam 10.4.46 was made by Shukadev Goswami to Maharaj Parikshit. Text 85 Unless human society accepts the dust of the lotus feet of great Mahatmas, devotees who have nothing to do with material possessions, mankind turn, cannot turn its attention to the lotus feet of Krishna. Those lotus feet vanquish all the unwanted, miserable conditions of material life. This verse appears in the Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th canto, 5th chapter, text 32, <clears throat> text 86. Henceforward, I shall certainly develop devotional service unto your lotus feet. For this reason, I have come to you and have fallen down at your lotus feet. Om Agyanati Nirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshirun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Srimate Radhanath Swami Niti Namine Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivakari Gaurav Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Mukham Karoti Vachalam Pango Langaya Tegiram Yatkripata Maham Vande Shri Guru Dinatari Nam Paramananda Madhavam Shri Chaitanya Ishwam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna, wishing all of you a very, very happy new year. Gorabdha 534. Uh, the day after Gaur Purnima, today is a very, very auspicious day. The day that Jagannath Mishra, the father of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, celebrated the appearance of his glorious son. So today is um, the festival of Jagannath Mishra, just like the day after Janmashtami is celebrated as Nandotsav. That Maharaj Nanda gave a feast to the entire uh, people of Raj because he had a son. Krishna was, um, Krishna had appeared the day of Janmashtami. So the next day Maharaj Nanda threw a huge feast 
for all the Vrajavasis. Similarly, the day that Mahaprabhu appeared, the golden moon appeared on the horizon of Nadia. The next day, Jagannath Mishra, the glorious father of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he threw a feast to entire Navadvip. So most of us, we fast uh, till moonrise yesterday on the appearance of Goranga Mahaprabhu because Mahaprabhu appeared at moonrise. So we fast till moonrise and then we break our fast with Ekadashi Prasad, with Anukalpa Prasad. That is what is recommended. Um, so we break our fast with Ekadashi Prasad and today at sunrise, around 7, 7, 15, um, whenever it's sunrise, we just break our fast with a little grain, just like we do on Dwadashi. And then today we actually do grain feast. So today is also a very, very auspicious day. And today for Gaudiya Vaishnavas, for all of us, is the mark of the new year. Many, many um, cultures have New Year celebrated on different times, at different times of the year. So for us as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, the appearance of Mahaprabhu is our calendar, is the mark of our calendar. So this day today is the first day of this new year. Yesterday was last day of the previous year, which was Gaurabdha 533. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu he appeared exactly 533 years ago. So today marks the first day of the new Gauravdha, which is 534. So we have stepped foot into 534th Gauravdha. So wishing all of you a very, very happy, prosperous, and full of service New Year. With that note, we'll start. Today's verses that we read were mostly what Prakashananda Saraswati. When Mahaprabhu came to the temple of Bindumadhava and Mahaprabhu started dancing ecstasy, ecstatically, it is described in, a, in the past few verses that how Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he danced, he chanted these beautiful verses. Hari Hari Nama Krishna Yadavaya Nama Gopal Govinda Ram Shri Madhusudam So it is said that Mahaprabhu would chant these two verses. Generally it is Hari Hari Nama Krishna Yadavaya Nama Yadavaya Madhavaya Keshavaya Nama Then Gopal Govinda Ram. But Mahaprabhu would skip the second line and he would just chant the first two Um you know, first and the third lines, Mahaprabhu would always chant that. Even when he would take out his Nagar Sankirtan, it would either be the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, which was most of the time, and sometimes Mahaprabhu would also chant these words. And Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport to this particular word that this mantra is exactly like the Mahamantra. So Mahaprabhu would very lovingly call out to these holy names, Hari Haraya Nama Krishna Yadavaya Namaha. Gopal Govinda Ram Sri Madhusudan. And when Mahaprabhu was dancing ecstatically, Kashi Mishra was there. There were four other associates with Mahaprabhu at that time. Sanatana Goswami was there. And Kashi Mishra was there. And they were all dancing and chanting these Hare Krishna Mahamantra and this particular mantra. They were chanting and Mahaprabhu's ecstatic dancing made everyone stand and gaze in amazement to witness the ecstasy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Srila Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami is so beautifully describing, this is one of the most beautiful descriptions of Goranga Mahaprabhu's ecstasy that is being described, that Mahaprabhu is, um, is he is compared to a Kadamba flower. And Mahaprabhu, when he is in ecstasy, Mahaprabhu is golden, and this Kadamba flower is also golden in color. It's yellowish golden color. And just like the Kadamba flower has, you know, little strands of, it appears like there's spikes shooting out. It's like a tennis ball, little golf ball, and there are, you know, spikes shooting out. So when Mahaprabhu would become very ecstatic, all the hair on Mahaprabhu's body would stand up, you know, like spikes. And Mahaprabhu would appear like this tender, delicate Kadamba flower. 
you know, whenever I think of Kadamba flowers, um, um, I remember one of my services that I used to do for Radha Madhava in Mayapur. Whenever there was Kadamba season, um, Kadamba, you know, when they are plucked, if any of you have seen Kadamba flower very closely, it has an enchanting smell. Enchanting smell. Very, very, very mild, but at the same time, very intoxicating. Very, very captivating fragrance Kadamba has. So Janani Prabhu had once taught me, I had I'd gone there for some service to the Pajari room, and he, I saw him doing something very amazing. He was holding the Kadamba flower in one hand, and in this hand, and with his right hand, he was, you know, just making it bounce over his right hand. And when he made it bounce, there was some white powder that, you know, was falling on his hand. And then he was keeping it in a bowl, whatever white powder was falling. So then he saw me, I saw him doing something like this, which I never had seen anyone do before. And he called me, he said, come, let me show you something. You know, we, you, and then Janani Prabhu started saying that, you know, Kadamba flowers, they are the ones that supply um, facial powder for the deities, for Radha and Krishna. I was like, really, how, what, I was not able to understand. So he said, we all use talcum powder. We all use so many different kinds of synthetic powder. But Radha and Krishna, in the forest, they would use the powders that are coming out from the fresh flowers. And Janani Prabhu showed me, he took one fresh Kadamba flower. And if you notice, the tip of the Kadamba flower has a you know, little white over there. And if you dust that part, there's powder that falls. And that powder is Kadamba powder. And it smells so intoxicating. So actually, Janani Prabhu, you know, he collected that powder, you know, from these fresh Kadamba flowers. And he was pouring it in a bowl which he would take in a in a little uh, cotton and he would offer it to Radharani as her facial powder and to the Sakhis and to Madhava. So I felt that was so nice and since then the Nanivasra was very kind that he allowed me to do that seva for the deities for Radha and Krishna. I felt very, very fortunate. So we would take out Kadamba flower powder and serve Shishi Radha Madhava and the Ashta Sakhis. Very special. So this is how Kadamba flowers, uh, you know, are having such great, you know, potency that they are so, you know, the purpose of their life is so fortunate that they get to adorn the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his consort in this way. And Mahaprabhu himself is described to look exactly like the Kadamba flower. So moving on. So seeing this ecstatic dancing of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Goranga Mahaprabhu was swaying like a golden mountain. He was dancing so beautifully with so much ecstasy that everyone was standing in amazement and witnessing the ecstatic dance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And from the crowd, everybody was chanting Hari Hari, Hari Hari. And these tumultuous sounds of Hari Hari reached the ears of Prakashananda Saraswati. And Prakashananda Saraswati came to the temple of Bindu Madhava. And as soon as Prakashananda Saraswati came, he, you know, Mahaprabhu saw Prakashananda Saraswati coming and he immediately sobered down, the Kirtan stopped. And uh, then Prakashananda Saraswati came to offer obeisances to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And when he, as soon as he touched the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu instead, he just clasped down to the lotus feet of Prakashananda Saraswati, saying that I am a very, very fallen soul. Mahaprabhu is teaching us how to win over the hearts of people through humility. Through genuine humility, how we can win over people's hearts. We can, you know, like Mahaprabhu, when he needed to be as strong as a Vajra, like lightning, as, lo- as strong as a thunderbolt, Mahaprabhu could be that. You know, when he was explaining the Brahma Bhashya to Prakashananda Saraswati, just a few verses before, that time Mahaprabhu was as strong as a thunderbolt. He did not deviate and he did not show at that time this kind of, you know, humility or in any of this way. No, he was 
giving the highest siddhanta to Prakashan and the Saraswati at that time. So Mahaprabhu could display these kind of emotions very, very genuinely. Sometimes we have to pretend, you know, like even the person who we don't like, we have to put up a false kind of a humility and just say, yeah, well, Hare Krishna, Hare Bol, how are you doing? And, you know, it just seems so artificial. People who are recipients, oh, yeah, by the way, I saw that video. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah, good. You could have done this, you could have done that. Yeah, but, you know, this, these kind of comments really are not coming from our hearts. And we can immediately understand it. It immediately, you know, anyone can get it. That nobody is a fool. You know, we tend to think that somebody will not understand if we deal with them artificially. People understand. People are very sensitive. People understand it very genuinely. When we are not genuinely associating with devotees, the other devotees get it. So we should never try to pretend what we don't want to do. We should never do that. But at least, you know, out of etiquette, there are certain things that we should, you know, we, we tend to always keep up, you know, doing that at least saying Hare Krishna whenever we meet, you know, even though we don't like the other person, just saying Hare Krishna and, you know, respecting the other person. We do all of that. But when we are genuinely happy with someone, we can show it in our behavior, in our nature. We definitely show it. So Mahaprabhu, even when he was angry at somebody, when he was being as strong as a thunderbolt, or when he was being genuinely humble with somebody, Mahaprabhu was always being very, very genuine. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu feels no envy towards anybody. He was not, you know, behaving as a... as strong as the thunderbolt when he was dealing with Kakashan and the Saraswati from a point of view of envy or from a point of view of feeling any kind of inferiority or anything of that sort. No. Mahaprabhu wanted to really give the highest knowledge to Kakashan and the Saraswati. So he was doing it out of compassion, out of love. And that was the same way that even our very own, very dear Srila Prabhupada would interact. Srila Prabhupada, one time in Australia, he gave a big talk with university students. And after the talk, there was one very young, enthusiastic student who shot up his hand in the air and said, when Prabhupada asked any questions, he just shot up his hand and said, I have a question. And Prabhupada said, yes. So then that student, he kind of challenged Srila Prabhupada. He said that, you are saying in your lecture that you know, uh, God is all powerful. He is, you know, He is all powerful. He is all, He's supreme. Well, I choose to be the all powerful God. Then Prabhupada, you know, he was really angry, you know, and those who were sitting next to Prabhupada, and many proper disciples have said this that when Prabhupada gets angry, Prabhupada's, you know, lower lip would quiver, it would shiver like this. Mr. Prabhupada was really angry. And he said, Oh, you claim to be the all powerful supreme personality of Godhead? He said, Yes, I claim to be the all powerful supreme personality of Godhead. Then Prabhupada said, Well, I claim that I can beat you up with my shoes. Can you stop me? And then that person was a little taken aback and he immediately said, well, give me some time. That was what that student's response was. And then Prabhupada said, my God is powerful all the time. And then Prabhupada immediately, after he said that, that person also sobered down immediately and Prabhupada said, please, you know, from that being like that thunder like a lightning, like lion, so ferocious, Prabhupada, immediately his mood changed and he became as soft as a delicate rose. And he said, please, don't waste your time in all this nonsense. Try to become godly. Don't try to become God. You know? So this is the humility of Srila Prabhupada. 
how he changed people's hearts, how he transformed the hearts of so many people. It was because he genuinely felt compassionate. He genuinely felt love for all conditioned souls. Prabhupada never, ever felt anything otherwise, just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And here, when Mahaprabhu was, you know, Prakash and Saraswati was catching on to the lotus feet of Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu fell down at his feet and said that I'm just a simple, you know, fallen sannyasi. And, you know, I don't even qualify to be the disciple of your disciple. That was Mahaprabhu's genuine humility. He said that to Prakash and Saraswati, that I don't even qualify to become your disciple of your disciple. And then Prakash and the Saraswati then started saying all these beautiful words, glorifying Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That my dear Lord, you know, sorry, uh, the 82, he's saying that you are the Supreme Lord and although you can consider yourself the Lord's servant, you're nonetheless worshipable. You're much greater than I am. Therefore, all my spiritual achievements have been lost because I blasphemed you. Blasphemy of of the Lord, what to I mean the Lord can also tolerate blasphemy to himself. But if we blaspheme devotees, the Lord will never tolerate. He will never forgive us. Never ever forgive us. So many instances we have seen, so many quotations from the scriptures we have seen that it is called the Mattahati. The mad elephant offense. The mad elephant offense just comes when the mad elephant is left into a garden. What does? What is the condition of the garden at that time after the mad elephant goes away? The entire garden is in a mess. All the you know tiny creepers, everything is trampled upon by the mad elephant. The mad elephant does not know what he's doing. The mad elephant is so covered in their own illusion that because they are so heavy, so bulky, they don't even care what is what or who is in their way. They will trample down anything and anyone. That is the mad elephant. So when we do Vaishnava Parab, when we talk ill about someone, when we talk nastily about someone, when we want to destroy the image of someone, when we spread wrong rumors about somebody, that is the greatest kind of offense that can ever be. Krishna will never forgive such offenses. And that is what is mentioned here in the subsequent verses that we read. But we'll go there in a little while. Text 83 that we read today is talking about, you know, Prakashan and the Saraswati is quoting from Srimad Bhagavatam, where he's saying that, O oh, great sage, out of many millions of materially liberated people who are free from ignorance, and out of many millions of Siddhas who have nearly attained perfection, there's hardly one pure devotee of Narayan. Only such a devotee is actually completely satisfied and peaceful. A similar statement is also there in the Bhagavad Gita 7th chapter 19th verse, but Krishna himself is saying, Bahunam Janmanamante, Dhyanavan Mamprapatyati, Vasudeva Sarvamiti, Sa Mahatma Sudurlapaha. That after many, many births and deaths, he who is actually in knowledge will actually surrender unto me. Knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is, and such a great soul is very, very rare. This is Krishna's verdict, and the same thing is proclaimed here in the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's very, very difficult to know Krishna. That who Krishna is actually, what his relationship is with Vaishnavas, with his devotees, is an impossible task to understand. How Krishna deals with his devotees. How dear are the devotees to him. How dear is everyone to Krishna. If we do anything even to an end, Krishna takes it personally. What to speak of his devotees. We should be very, very, you know, to know Krishna is first of all very difficult, which Bhagavad Gita is stating. And here, Srimad Bhagavatam is saying, <clears throat> even amongst many people who are siddhas, means yogic perfectionists, those who are, you know, studying the Vedic scriptures, doing all sorts of, you know, services, all combine all of them together, millions, out of millions of such people, one person can become a Vishnu Bhakta. 
That is what this verse in the Bhagavatam is saying. That is how rare a devotee is. The next statement from the Srimad Bhagavatam 10th canto, which is made by Shukadev Goswami to Parikshit Maharaj, is when a person mistreats great souls, his lifespan, opulence, reputation, religion, possessions, and good fortune are all destroyed. Very significant statement. Taking, you know, nothing and making it into something and destroying a person's spiritual career is the worst offense that can be ever done to anybody. Even if those devotees forgive those people, Krishna never forgives. Those people, those devotees who are offending someone, who are mistreating great souls. And who are great souls? According to the definition of Krishna, great souls are those who are sincerely trying to follow another great soul. Who are sincere. There are many descriptions of great soul. So who are sincerely following another great soul? Who are sincerely engaged in the mission of another great soul? Who are sincerely chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra? Who are sincerely trying to serve? These are great souls. These are Mahatmas. And if anything is done towards them, mistreatment is done towards them, then their lifespan, their opulences, their reputation, their religion, possessions and good fortune, everything is destroyed. Very heavy statement. Very, very heavy statement. Indra was about to lose everything. After the greatly horrible act that he did of seven days, seven nights inundating Vrindavan with floods and torrential rains, he tortured the Prajapasis. So Krishna would not even look at Indra's face. He would not look at Indra's face. He was about to take away everything from Indra. From the king of heaven, he would have become a pauper if it was not for Mother Surabhi. The cows are so dear to Krishna, so dear to Krishna. Krishna can never say no to the cows. So Indra, he realized his mistake. That is another thing. Just like here Prakashananda Saraswati is saying, I have realized, I have blasphemed you, my Lord, but now I have come to my senses, I have realized my greatest mistake. And he's coming to beg for forgiveness. So similarly, Indra was realizing his mistake, that he has committed a blunder, not just an offense, but a blunder he has committed. And when Indra realized that, he was too scared to come in the audience of the Lord. To come in the presence of the Lord, he was so scared. He knew that if he goes in the presence of the Lord, the Lord will reduce him into ashes with his anger. The Lord was so angry with Indra. Krishna was so angry at that time. So to pacify Krishna's anger, Indra sought the shelter first of his own Guru Maharaj. And as Guru Maharaj Brahaspati gave him this way that, you know, go and beg forgiveness from Surabhi Mata. Explain your situation to Mother Surabhi. And if she is pleased with you, she will take you to Krishna and recommend you. And if she recommends you to Krishna, then there is some hope that Krishna will forgive you. So Indra did exactly that. Without any ego, without having any kind of, you know, imagine the same King Indra who just seven days ago was torturing everybody in Vrindavan. That same Indra jumps down from his Airavata, his five-headed elephant, and he just came down like, and he fell down like a stick at the lotus feet of Mother Surabhi and said, Mother Surabhi, please, I'm seeking your shelter. Please, please ask Krishna to forgive me. And Mother Surabhi is mother. She, her heart is made of butter. It's melt, it just melted looking at Indra's genuine state. She was moved by the genuineness of Indra. And seeing the genuine nature of Indra, 
Immediately, Mother said, he said, yes, come with me. I will take you to Krishna. And she came and recommended Krishna to forgive Indra. And Krishna could not say a word. He did not say a word to Mother Surabhi. No, I will not forgive. No, this, no, that. No, Krishna didn't say any of that. Immediately, seeing the humble appeal of Mother Surabhi and seeing the genuine humility and the kind of, you know, remorse that Indra was really, really feeling. He was genuinely very remorseful. He was realizing his mistake. And he came to beg for forgiveness. And Mother Surabhi has forgiven him. Krishna immediately forgave Mother Surabhi. Sorry, Indra. Similarly, we see in the case of Jagai and Madhai. Lord Nityananda, if it was not for Lord Nityananda, Madhai would not stand a chance. Mahaprabhu had already invoked Sudarshan. And Sudarshan, once invoked, never goes back without doing his job. That is the service of Sudarshan. As soon as Sudarshan is called, he will come, he will do his job, and he will go. But Nityananda was so powerful that he had the potency to make Sudarshan go back even without finishing his job. He did not allow Sudarshan to do his job, to do his service, which he had come to do. Mahaprabhu had already invoked Sudarshan. He was, you know, going to put Sudarshan on, just to cut off Madhai's head. And Nityananda Prabhu, the most compassionate Adi Guru, stood in the way. He said, no, Madhai needs to be forgiven, my Lord. Please forgive him. When Haridas Thakur was beaten in 22 marketplaces, Mahaprabhu himself came and took those beatings on his own body because Mahaprabhu first wanted to again invoke Sudarshan to kill those miscreant soldiers, to kill that Mohammedan king. Mahaprabhu wanted to invoke the Sudarshan. And Haridas Thakur was constantly saying, Mahaprabhu, please forgive them. Please forgive them. That is a genuine devotee who prays for the forgiveness of those who do inhuman activities towards another devotee. A genuine devotee forgives them. But other devotees don't forgive that. If it is done to them, they will forgive it. But when they see another Vaishnava being tortured like this, those devotees cannot tolerate it. Those devotees then become like lions. But a devotee himself, when atrocities are happening on the devotee himself, at that time the devotee always forgives. Always forgives. Haridas Thakur was constantly praying that Mahaprabhu, please forgive these miscreants. They do not know what they are doing. Please forgive them. Please forgive them. The Mahaprabhu could not send his Sudarshan. So what did Mahaprabhu do? He himself came and embraced Haridas Thakur and took the beatings upon his own back. He did not let Haridas Thakur get whipped. And Mahaprabhu himself gave his back. When devotees had personally seen Mahaprabhu after this incident, they saw, you know, whip marks on Mahaprabhu's back. That's the mercy of Gauranga Mahaprabhu. That is how much Mahaprabhu is attached to his devotee. Krishna is attached to his devotee. We should never take this thing lightly. Devotees are very, very dear to Krishna. When we say anything bad about a devotee, it is like an arrow being shot at Krishna's chest. Krishna never forgives that. Only service to that particular devotee and when that devotee forgives us, then Krishna forgives. Otherwise, our the the mercy of Krishna which is flowing down, there's a wall that comes in between. And that mercy flowing is stopped. We should be very, very careful. Here again, text eighty five is another quotation from Srimad Bhagavatam that unless human society 
accepts the dust of the lotus feet of great Mahatmas, devotees who have nothing to do with material possessions, mankind cannot turn its attention to the lotus feet of Krishna. Those lotus feet vanquish all the unwanted, miserable conditions of material life. So to dispay the, the, the miserable material conditions that we are in, the only solution is not the lotus dust from the lotus feet of Krishna. It is the dust from the lotus feet of Krishna's devotees. The lotus feet dust of the Mahatmas. Of those souls who are dear to Krishna. If we can just put the dust of their lotus feet on our head, that is the perfection of our life. So here again, text 86. Shri Prakashananda Saraswati is thus concluding after he quoted 83, 84, and 80, uh, 85, these three verses from the Srimad Bhagavatam. After quoting these verses, Prakashananda Saraswati is concluding that henceforward I shall certainly develop devotional service unto your lotus feet, O Mahaprabhu. For this reason I have come to you and have fallen back at your lotus feet. A genuine, you know, way of begging for forgiveness. This is what we have to learn from these, you know, Vardhats, these, these exchanges that are there for our benefit, that we can learn these things, that how we need to beg forgiveness, how we really need to imbibe this genuine mood that, you know, please, let's not do anything that Krishna does not like. Before doing anything, can we just stop and think that will Krishna like this? Will my Guru Maharaj like what I'm doing or what I'm about to say? If they don't like what I'm about to say or what I'm going to be doing, then why should I do something like that? We should consciously think like this before we engage in any activity or we engage in any kind of talk. So with this, we will um, try to, you know, make a resolution in this new year Gorabdha. 534th Gorabdha, that let's, let's really genuinely try to imbibe these kind of, you know, life lessons from these leelas, how to be genuine, how to be able to forgive, how to be able to not commit offenses to Vaishnavas. How do we actually seek shelter of the holy names? How do, what it actually means to seek shelter of the holy names? to seek shelter of the devotees. How do we actually do that? So these are things that we need to meditate on. So with this thought, we will end here. If there's any questions, comments, or reflections, we can take that now. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Thank you so much for the beautiful class. And thank you for uh, for talking on Vaishnava Parat, Mataji. Thank you so much. So, Mataji, how do we know that, uh, um, like uh, you were talking, right? Uh, will this uh, help um, make my guru happy or like that? So, how how do I know that uh, whatever we are doing is guru is happy or not? Well, um, whatever we are doing, if Guru is happy or not, the representative of the Guru will be able to tell you that. And, uh, you know, when we feel, you know, <laughs> one very interesting conversation that happened between Srila Prabhupada and one of his disciples, some of his disciples actually, was that um, something similar, you know, Prabhupada asked the question, that how do we know Krishna is supreme? How do we know Krishna is supreme? So one of the devotees said, oh, Prabhupada, because the Bhagavad Gita says so. And some other devotee said, oh, because Prabhupada, you say it. That's why Krishna is supreme. And then one other devotee, you know, there were many devotees who were giving many, many reasons. And Shri Prabhupada said, no. It's because you feel the ecstasy. When you chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, you feel the ecstasy. If Krishna was not the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you would not feel the ecstasy. 
And you feel the ecstasy. That's why you're able to continue every single day. That is proof that Krishna is supreme. So Prabhupada laughed like that and then he just turned around and he uh, kept walking. After a few days, again to the same group, Prabhupada again stopped and he asked, so how do we know Krishna is supreme? So then those devotees who were present, they said, oh, Prabhupada, Prabhupada, because we feel the ecstasy. When we chant the holy names, we feel the ecstasy. And Prabhupada looked at them. They said, no, because the Bhagavad Gita says so. <laughs> and he just walked around and he walked away. So <laughs> what is the main purport of this? The main thing is that it's the combination of both. It's the combination of everything. The why Krishna is the Supreme or how is Krishna the Supreme? The Bhagavad Gita says it. Prabhupada said it. And we feel the ecstasy. So all the three answers are correct. But similarly, how do we know that we are pleasing the Guru? The Guru gives us service of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Are we feeling the ecstasy when we are chanting the mantra? If we are, then yes, we are pleasing the Guru. The Guru has given us so many other kinds of services. We have so many different kinds of engagements. And if the services that we are doing, if they are satisfying our heart, then yes, we are pleasing the Guru. But if they are not satisfying to our heart, then we should understand that the Guru is not pleased or there's something that is wrong. Then we should ask some senior devotees whom we have some faith in. Then we should ask them who we feel could be the representatives of our Guru. We can ask them that where am I going wrong or what should I really be doing? If there's any kind of confusion that we have, that what I'm doing is it pleasing to my Guru or not, if we don't have the access to ask our gurus directly, then we can ask the representatives of our guru, the senior, you know, God brothers. We can ask them what they feel. Uh, give them specific of your situation and ask them. And we will know. But this is just a very generic answer to your question. I hope this helps. Yes, Mataji. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the answer. Hare Krishna, is there anybody having any questions or realizations for Mataji? Hare Krishna, Mataji, can you hear me? Yes, Hare Krishna. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Paul. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was kind of able to hear you. Hi, Krishna Mataji. Thank you for a wonderful class, and especially about the Vaishnava Parada. I have one question. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> what if, when we are offended by somebody, or we know somebody who's been offended, and you don't have it in your heart to forgive, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then should you, how how you know how much of it is is should we accept as I don't know maybe karma or something or and you know, how can we how can we in our real you know we may say yes I forgive you because that's what we're supposed to do but what yeah. if we're really hurt and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we don't feel it in our heart right. Um, you know, first of all, let me ask you, are you feeling hurt that they did something to you or to some other other devotee? Uh, um, some other devotee. Not to you? Not specifically to me, no. Okay, that's perfectly fine then. Because um, I asked the same question to Jayapataka Maharaj. And uh, Jayapadaka Maharaj gave me a very wonderful answer, which I will repeat it to you. See, the thing is that when something happens to us specifically, um, and that's the reason why I asked this question to you, that, you know, was it to you or to somebody else? Um, 
when something happens to us, you know, by another devotee, it actually is, you know, after a couple years in Krishna consciousness, once we know the philosophy, once we know, okay, genuine humility and everything that is, you know, we are supposed to do, the forgiveness comes quite automatically, you know, I would say it comes. Uh, when it when something happens to us, we just say, yes, one formula, you know, which always keeps going on in our mind that I deserve worse than this. You know, and Krishna is really kind that he's giving me just this much and I actually deserve much more. So therefore, it's very easy for us to forgive, you know, um, mm-hmm. when yes. this happens on towards, towards ourselves. <coughs> but when it happens with another devotee, someone who, who we hold very dear to our life, um, when it happens to somebody else, it's very, very tough to forgive. Very tough to forgive. And um, that can be forgiven if we just, um, you know, actually that would not really be considered to be forgiveness in the, in the first place, you know, because mm. you are actually feeling love for that particular devotee, which is making you feel... Um, I would not use the word resentful because this is not what Jephthah Maharaj used. So I would just say he used the word bad. You would just feel, you know, not such good feelings would come in your mind when you think of that particular person, you know, so to speak. And that's perfectly okay, you know. But at the same time, we know that there are certain etiquettes that we can't really uh, not do without. Like, for example... Even though we know that, that there's a, this particular devotee A who has offended particular devotee B who is extremely dear to me, okay? Yeah. So I cannot tolerate devotee A and have a place in my heart to forgive devotee A for what he has done to devotee B, he or she. So in that case, it's not really forgiveness that is coming into account. It is actually the love. Krishna actually takes it like this, that your love for devotee B is so much great that you are ready to, you know, let go of your relationship with devotee A, you know. But at the same time, you are following certain things of, you know, keeping minimal, um, like say, for example, if you just come face to face, you would not, you know, just uh, turn your back and go towards that person, you would at least just say Hare Krishna and all that and just move on, you know, and you would do that and you would probably even, you know, uh, if it's other relative, if it's not a devotee, you would try to avoid their situation as much as possible and and that's what is even said by Prabhupada about like-minded and unlike-minded devotees, that we associate with like-minded devotees, but if we are not comfortable with particular devotees, uh, the formula is that we stay away from such devotees and uh, stay away and just not associate with them. But if you are faced with them, then, you know, at least offer minimum respect because the Vaishnava offers respect even to an end. So we just offer respect and that's it. Okay, that's okay. It. Okay, so yeah, so that's, that, yeah. Yeah, that's how he answered this question, which I tried to repeat it to you, that okay. Krishna sees it this way, that our love for devotee B is so high, Krishna actually just sees that, you know? Okay. And the way we deal with devotee A or with anybody else is, you know, just keep distance. Keep distance. Okay. Yeah? Think that, that's why I was thinking, because if you come in the association, because... We don't want to be committing Vaishnava Parad by even okay. thinking bad thoughts of A and, you know, and, and being resentful, yeah. you know, whatever. Well, as you right. said, it's not resentful, but we feel a little bit angered or upset, hurt or Correct. upset that somebody's being. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to be a party of it by, um, you know, like you said, we don't want to completely avoid somebody. Um, Correct. Well, maybe we do want to avoid somebody. We might want to avoid them, <laughs> but we don't want to in any way, you know, by our thoughts or our actions, um, yeah. um, somehow be offensive to anybody, Correct. like you said, not even Correct. angels, so because it seems like it, we're Correct. in like a fine line. Okay. Thank you much. Mm-hmm. That helps about being respectful, but we, we are allowed to keep our distance. 
Yes, absolutely, because that's a general guideline Prabhupada's given, you know, associating with like-minded people. Prabhupada mm-hmm. said, yes, associate with like-minded people, and those who you don't feel like-minded with, stay away. Just stay okay. away. Okay. That's the same, you know, golden rule to follow. Yeah. Thank you, Madhya. Thank you. It was a beautiful question. Thank you. Any more questions? Or comments? Hare All right. Hare Krishna. Vrinda Gopika Mataji. Hare Krishna Mataji, Koti Koti Dandrat Pranam. How nicely you narrated what we should not do, Vaishnava Prath and forgiveness and Mataji that Kadamma flower story that the powder is coming and offered to Shishi Radha Mata. Thank you very much Mataji. Koti Koti Dandrat Pranam. Shila Prabhupada, Shila Prabhupada, pray for us this Kartik month qualified to enter in Shidham Mayapurdham with our Guru Deva. Hare Vaum. Hare Vaum. Hare Vaum. Hare Krishna. Thank you. All right. Okay. Yeah, if there are no more questions or realizations, we can end the call here. Once again, thank you so much, Kalasudha Mataji, for beautiful class. Okay, let us, let me offer obeisances to Mataji.